I'll be reading from the New King James Version, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not do, do not be comforted to this world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Thank you, Brother Roger, so much. And we got started with our study this morning in our morning sermon through the book, Is the Bible God's Word? And we were looking at the Bible's claim of inspiration, that God is the one who uh, inspired the writers, that He inspired them through speaking, uh, that He inspired them word for word, and that the word that we find in the Bible as given by God is given for us to be approved in His sight. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we also notice there 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. And so, in light of the Bible's claim for inspiration from God, as it must do if it is inspired of God, which it is, uh, what then do we do with that? And that is how the afternoon sermons will go throughout the year. That is the plan, uh, in the sense that we will cover the material in the book in the morning, and then we will make a, 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 an application of some sort relevant to our study in the AM. just want to make a, a note uh, briefly before we dive in. Uh, again, just a reminder that the uh, youth will be meeting about the widows and friends. I think that's what we'll call it. Widows and friends and their friends, widows and their friends luncheon on January 22nd. So again, um, the, the widows of the congregation as well as uh, unrepresented ladies, the friends of the widows, um, we all are wanting to serve lunch and the young people We'll be needing to organize that so that uh, we can all know what we need to be doing and how we can serve in a particular fashion. Again, that's January 22nd at 12.45 p.m., a meeting on that, on that regard. And also, as it relates to just organization and different things that we have going on, uh, Steve told me that there was a message sent out on GroupMe. We actually looked during lunch. It looks like several have already uh, accepted it uh, into the band app. And so that uh, invite is there in GroupMe, and you can then load into the band group uh, in that app so that we can then use that for uh, collaborating and organization, uh, again, reminders of activities, polls and sign-up sheets, those kinds of things. And so keep that in mind as well. All right, so let's answer and dive into the correction aspect of why the scriptures are given uh, given the fact that God has provided us His Word so that we can be approved in His sight. And we're going to look at it from the lens, as Roger just read a few minutes ago, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, not conforming to this world, but being transformed. Every day, we are bombarded with temptation to mold ourselves and fit into society's narrative of how it is we should operate. And by the way, if you attempted to even find logic in their efforts to persuade us to come in their direction, it wouldn't even make any sense. It's contradictory. It's all over the place. It doesn't uh, in any way uh, make a, a bit of sense at all. Uh, and that's what humanistic atheism gets you. But God has commanded us to not align ourselves and mold ourselves with society, but instead be transformed. And I don't really think we could ever probably top the illustration of the Transformers, uh, and I'm speaking to the actual robotic figures that drive around in cars and then all of a sudden morph into a fighting robot. I don't think we're ever going to be able to beat that illustration. God does not want us to mold ourselves to this world, 
But just as a transformer goes from one type of structure to then all of a sudden becoming a completely different kind of structure, God wants us and our lives to not be molded to society and to our current generation, but rather transform and become something different. Not for the sake of being different, but for the sake of glorifying Him, to serve Him so that we can live acceptably in His sight, just as Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 uh, lays out for us. So, how is it that we're going to do this? Well, uh, there's a word that I'm probably going to be using more and more and more as time goes on, and the reason for it is because of these right here. And that is the word intentionality. I think one of the biggest challenges that our young people face, that the current generation faces as it relates to doing what is right, really has to do with intentionality. It's not that we don't know what's right, especially if you think about us and our Bible classes and constantly being ingrained in God's Word. It's that we are not necessarily rising up daily with intention to do what is right. And in order to live our life in a way that we aren't conformed to society, but instead like a transformer outside of that mold... It requires intentionality. In other words, we have to say, today I'm going to be different. Today I'm not going to be like society. I'm not going to be like all my Facebook friends and my my Snap friends and my, my Graham friends. I'm going to be what God wants me to be for His glory. And think about what Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 2 regarding intentionality. Paul writes there, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul didn't just show up and randomly just be the Christian man he was supposed to be around the Corinthian brethren. Paul didn't just, because his name is Paul, his first name is an apostle, uh, he didn't just all of a sudden wake up and he just was the Christian man he was supposed to be. Paul determined, he had intentionality, he was purposeful, deciding to live a Christian life. Uh, Brethren, we're not going to be approved in God's sight by accident. That's not going to happen. We're not going to come to the end of our life standing before the judgment seat of God and, oh, by accident, I happen to be approved in the sight of God. We will be approved in His sight if we have made a determination with intentionality to seek His approval and to live in it via His Word. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Jehovah God has given us the Bible, so that we can know all the aspects of what's required in order to be transformed. Now, again, think about those transformers, the actual robotic figures. Uh, What do they do? Especially think about like the television shows and the movies, those kinds of things. I mean, it looks absolutely seamless, doesn't it? They just poof, all of a sudden, all the gadgets and gizmos, all the, the makeup of their mechanics, all of a sudden just morph into this transformed being. But if you were to ever attempt to actually build something like that, what would be needed? A whole lot of technical knowledge. A whole lot of engineering expertise as to how you go from here to here. And so how is it that we're going to move from not being conformed to this world and instead, by intention and determination, be transformed? We're going to need to apply the Word of God, which corrects us and gives us the guidance, the will of God, so that we can succeed in that endeavor. Let's go through some categories here as it relates to not being conformed to this world, but being transformed. I want you to think about three common areas that you can evaluate in your life on a regular basis to consider your stance regarding your faithfulness to God. 
Number one, we should be engaging in that exercise continually. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. God wants us to go through the continual practice of evaluating our lives as to whether or not we are standing right with God. James will write this in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and in verse 23 he says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So you think about the process of evaluation. We are continually evaluating ourselves. We're intending to do that. We're determining. We're saying, hey, here's the world. This is the direction the world's going in. I don't want to go in that direction. I'm going to evaluate myself using the Word of God and consider whether or not I'm actually going in God's direction. What changes do I need to make? What corrections do I need to apply? Now, we do this with our physique, do we not? Yeah. Maybe there's some of y'all, I don't know, but I would imagine every one of us looks in the mirror probably at least once a day. Some of us maybe once an hour, I don't know. Maybe some of y'all haven't looked in the mirror in years, I have no idea. Once I get up there in age, I probably won't want to look in the mirror. I don't know. But we understand the process. And why are we doing that? We're concerned about whether or not we are keeping up with ourselves. A am I in a presentable fashion? Maybe because of work. Maybe because of someone we'd like to woo from a romantic perspective. So we contemplate how it is we appear. Well, what is our process in doing that as it relates to spirituality? Are we just going to all of a sudden one day accidentally just look the way we ought to look? Well, let me ask you a question. Does it work that way physically regarding what you look at in the mirror when you wake up? Uh, our children have learned the term bedhead and have learned that bedhead is not an appropriate look when it comes to going out into society. Because you don't just pop up out of the bed and just appear in the way you ought to appear regarding your efforts to mingle around with folks. So we understand that physically, but what about spiritually? Well, sometimes, well, you know, I'm not really, <laughs> preacher said something over there. I'm some Bible class over here. I don't really, I'm not really thinking much about this. Well, wait a second, pause. Are we determining with intentionality, asking ourselves the question, am I conforming to the world? Or through the technicality, through all the engineering aspects, imagine that transformer, am I doing what I need to do to be transformed for God's glory? What are some categories we can consider? Category number one, the appropriation of self. The appropriation of self. The use of self. Who we are. We could be defined and made up in, in a couple different ways. We could be looking at ourselves from a spiritual perspective. We could look at ourselves from a mental or a mind perspective, an emotional perspective, a physical perspective, how we actually use our capabilities, our body. How do we put it forth? Well, let's think about it from a mind perspective, the appropriation of self. Am I being conformed to this world or am I using the word of God, that which he has delivered? He has inspired the writers to write it so that I cannot be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How am I using, appropriating the use of my mind? We just went through an entire year of study, my life in him. What was the theme of that study? What was the core text? Psalm 119 and verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Am I filling my mind with the word of God? Am I allowing my mind to marinate, to contemplate, to consider, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Well, how diligent are we really supposed to be at this? Again, we're talking about intentionality. We're talking about determination. Is this just a, a casual nice to? What does God's word teach us regarding our appropriation of mind? Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, notice, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Folks, there's no such thing as a lazy Christian. 
There is no such thing as a casual Bible student right in the sight of God. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, a workman, a workman with all thy getting, get understanding. And sometimes you might say, well, that's, that's a lot. A lot of effort. You know, Hannah and I have realized when we get together at the end of the year as family, there are high points. Man, there's points we walk away. We are so encouraged. And there's also some low points. Points you walk away and you're like, oh man, I can't believe they're doing this. I can't believe they said that. There's a moment last year. Family had been engaged throughout the year doing some pretty extensive complex, hard to navigate, recreational items. Traveling here, going there, getting passport, getting on boats, flying here, flying there. Families throughout the year will do things from a recreational perspective. If you charted out the work and the diligence to get that done, folks, it's extensive. Then you start to think about spiritual things. You start to think about going to Bible class. You start to think about opening your Bible to study it and feast on the Word. You know what people say? Well, you know, I just, you know, preacher, I mean, I'm just, I got a lot going on. I'm just real busy. I just, you know, that's just, I just don't have the time. And, you know, it's just, oh man, that's just, well, you know, maybe at some point I'll, you know, get around to... Wait a second. We understand work. It's not a question of whether or not we understand work. We understand work when it's something we want to do. We'll do it. We will do it. The question is, our mind, how is it being used? With intention? With determination? Are we setting our mind with purpose to track with the Word of God? See, our society has ejected from that being baked into daily life. It doesn't happen anymore. You don't go to school anymore and the teacher read the Bible. You don't sit down at the table anymore with mom and dad gathered around, dad coming in from the farm, and everybody gets to be entertained that evening with the Scripture. Society is no longer giving us the privilege of biblical truths baked in to our everyday life. It's no longer present. So what do we have to do? With intention, say, I am going to feast on God's Word. How do you do that? How do you do it with other things that matter? For you, it might be a calendar reminder. It might be having an accountability partner. Hey, I'd like you to ask me at the end of the week how much of the Bible I studied. It might be just a matter of pausing every day and asking yourself, how is it that at the end of this day, my mind is going to have grown in the Scripture? Then at the end of the day, taking that pause and evaluating. We all have our own approach. But here's the thing, when something matters to us, we'll get it done. We'll figure out a way. Hannah knows that she's not around and I'm at home. It's pretty unlikely that I'm going to make a sandwich. But let me tell you something, I'm going to find something to eat. 
I will figure out a way to do something to eat. What about feasting on the Word of God? What's the appropriation of our mind? What's the appropriation of our emotions? How are we applying our emotions? You know, one of the worst things that I think has probably happened concerning the overall picture of religion and the pendulum swinging from Catholicism and the going through the motions, checking the box, traditions of men, is the pendulum has swung then to high emotionalism completely detached from Scripture. And I think the church in the last several decades has been in reaction to that emotionalism to the point where the idea was put forth that emotions should not exist for the Christian. We shouldn't be emotional. We shouldn't have emotional interests and investments. We don't find that in the Scripture, brethren. Our emotions need to be guided by truth. They need to be rooted in the knowledge of the Scripture. But the Scripture teaches us to be emotional about God. Jesus says in Mark chapter 12 and in verse 30, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Being in love with God. Being in love with God's people. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, shows this type of affection in his writings. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, he writes, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I mean, just look at that word. That's just one verse. He loves God's people. One of the most beautiful statements I've ever heard is a, is a young person about the age of five or six stating, I love the brethren. Unprovoked. They said, I miss and love the brethren. I just I think about that. It just melts my heart. What is the appropriation of our emotions? What is the appropriation of our mind? What is the appropriation of our body? How are we putting our body to work. Well, we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 4 the need to be mindful as to whether or not we are uh, using our body correctly and whether or not we are avoiding the use of our body in an incorrect manner. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning there in verse 4, Paul writes by inspiration that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. I mean, that's just really plain. Possess your own vessel in purity. Verse 5, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. God wants us to use our body for holiness. Why? Well, because the things that we do in our body are the things that are going to judge us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or good. Or bad. Uh, God is going to evaluate the fruit that we produce based upon how we've used our body. Now, let me ask you a question. Which of you, when you pick up your phone and start using it, want to try to open up an app and it doesn't open? Which of you then, when you use that app and you go through all the steps and the processes that it requires, and once you complete it, like that app to completely crash and everything be erased. Who likes that? I don't know of anyone who enjoys that experience. We get frustrated with those kinds of experiences. Why? Because we put in certain types of work and we expect a certain return. We expect a certain outcome. Well, guess what? God has given us life. He's given us this body, this mind. He's given us our heart, our emotions. He's allowed us to live. Well, what does he want in return? Fruit. Fruit. But are we going to crash? We have an error 401. <laughs> Will we be offloaded? Jesus says the following in John chapter 15, starting there in verse 1, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is 
the husbandman, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. My brethren, God is crystal clear. Uh, the Word of God is not going to return unto Him void. It is to be used. And we are to use it correcting our lives, being transformed to glorify Him. Where do you sit this afternoon? in regards to your life. Which direction are you headed in? Are you conforming yourself to society? Are you going kind of like through Groundhog's Day? Every day, waking up, and next thing you know, you just did the same exact thing you did the day before. There's no improvement. There's no development. There's no intentionality and determination to have used the Word of God as given by Him to become who you can be for His glory. Brother or sister, if you need prayers of the congregation, if you need to be restored, if there's anything we can do to assist you, we're here to help. Maybe you're here this afternoon, you're not yet a child of God. You've not yet made the decision to put on Christ via baptism. We learn in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27 that we become children of God when we do that very thing. We put on Jesus Christ via baptism. If you've not yet done that this afternoon, you have the opportunity to do so. If you have any spiritual need, won't you please come forward? It's all together. We stand. Lord, my spirit.